Welcome to the Voice of Hope stream. Our hope and prayer is that you are being blessed by these weekly streams and messages that we're sharing with you. Please remember to subscribe to our online channels on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Instagram, and to share these with other people so that they too may enjoy these blessings. If you need someone to pray for you, please send an email to prayforme at voiceofhope.church and we will definitely take you up to the Lord in prayer. Otherwise, may God bless you as you fellowship with us. I thank you. Hello boys and girls, this is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story for you called Bitter Water to Better Water. Today's memory verse is from Revelation chapter 7, verse 17. It says, He will lead them to springs of living water. The message for today's story is we thank God for giving us water. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean really, really, really thirsty. Well, a long time ago, the children of Israel were so thirsty, they thought they would die of thirst. The Israelites rejoiced as the great pillar of cloud led them out of Egypt and away from their lives of slavery. They followed as it led them across the Red Sea and out into the wilderness. But after three days of walking in the desert, the Israelites had used up all the water they had brought with them from Egypt. The children were thirsty. The grown-ups were thirsty. The animals were thirsty. Everyone in the whole camp of Israel was very, very thirsty. The cloud led them toward a place called Mara. Moses had been a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years, and he knew the area well. Moses knew that there was water at Mara, but he also knew that it tasted so bad that the people wouldn't be able to drink it. In fact, the word Mara means bitter. But the people didn't know that. As soon as they saw the water, they grew excited. Water! Water! There's water up ahead! Some of the people ran forward to the water. But when they tasted it, their happiness turned to disappointment. Now, the people felt even thirstier than they had before they saw the bitter water. They began to grumble and complain to Moses. Moses knew that God had not left his people. He knew that God would take care of their needs. So Moses prayed to God and asked for help, and God told Moses what to do. He told Moses to find a piece of wood and to throw the wood into the water. Moses did as God said, and the water turned sweet. Once again, all the people rushed towards the water. This time, they were not disappointed. They drank all they wanted of the cool, sweet water. Children, grown-ups, and animals drank all the water they wanted. God had worked a miracle to care for their needs, including their great need for water in the desert. They thanked God and praised Him for taking care of them. God takes care of our needs just as He did for the Israelites way back then. He makes sure that we have water and food and a safe place to sleep. He gives us families and friends and air to breathe. We may not always get what we want, but God makes sure that we have what we need. Let's thank God for taking care of our needs. This podcast was brought to you by gracelink.net and Studio El Piso. For more children's resources, please visit gracelink.net. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, there were an estimated 9.6 million adults diagnosed with several mental illnesses and an estimated 43.7 million adults in the U.S. with any form of mental illness. From anxiety to obsessive-compulsive disorder in a recent study. That's a fact, but there's hope. One study showed that individuals for whom religion serves as the defining and organizing purpose of their lives recovered more quickly from bouts of depression. And for those with serious mental illness, religious and spiritual activities are the most often cited in strategies that are beneficial to their state of mind. 
all rights and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ.
Good morning, the saints and voice of hope, Berea City Church and its companies. We're so glad that we could meet again and worship the Lord together in the beauty of His holiness. I invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 6. The book of John, chapter 6. And I am reading from verse uh, 16. The Bible says, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. In other translations, and immediately the boat reached the destination which it was heading. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father in heaven, we have read a word and we invite your word in our hearts that in the midst of the burdens that we bear, the sorrows and so many questions without answers, we ask that at the end of this sermon, we may have just one reason to continue to have faith in Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The beginning of the verse 16 says, Now when evening came, we will do well to know what was happening during the day, because oftentimes our response and our attitude, our reaction, our experience in the evening is determined how we have walked with God during the day. The Bible says that Christ had moved uh, to the Sea of Tiberias after leaving Jerusalem, and a multitude followed him. And after seeing them uh, flocking to him, inquired from his disciples, what are we going to do to this multitude? They are hungry, and I do not want to let them go back home without any food. Philip came with a suggestion and said, well, 200 days salary may not even be enough to serve all these multitudes. And then Andrew came probably with a better suggestion, not known unto him also. He said, there's a young boy here with five loaves of bread and two fish, but what are they to many who are here with us? Jesus asked the disciples to make everybody sit down, and after breaking the bread, blessing it, and allow them to give to all the multitude. The record says at the end of the day that 12 baskets were collected and everybody was fed and he told them to keep them aside. Everybody was joyful. In fact, they testified that a prophet is amongst us. And then there was a caucus later on towards verse 20 that they gathered together and say, oh, truth, this is the man that we needed most. They might have remembered what Moses did for 40 years in the wilderness. Manna fell down and they said, if Moses could do that, how much more with this man? He would do greater things and we have seen greater things that he has done before. And they caucused and concluded that we need to make this man to become a king. The disciples also joined their suggestion. Well, I think Peter, James, and others felt that somehow this is a grand opportunity for them to be somebodies in their communities. Their hopes have been centered on this man to change their lives and the lives of the whole nation. To their disappointment, Jesus refuses to actually accept the suggestion and goes into the mountains. What a disappointment to them. That's an opportunity. They felt that it was an opportunity for them to become something different, to be somebody's. But somehow Jesus doesn't seem to seize the opportunity. Have you come to that situation where you feel that Jesus has failed to seize the opportunity for you to actually gain the success and prosperity and your dreams to come through? This was the disappointment that disciples had gone through. And then even besides that, Jesus now commands them to go to the other shore and he doesn't even go with them. 
as they get into the boat, thoughts still linger in their minds and hoping maybe Jesus might actually change his mind. And as they decided that somehow a time goes by and Jesus does not change his mind, they decided to get into the boat and go to the other shore. The Bible says that as they had rowed three or four miles along the way, a storm comes in again along the way without Jesus in their presence. They could be asking themselves, what manner of a savior is this who has actually denied our opportunity to become successful in our lives? But more than that, knowing very well that there'll be a storm ahead of us, he lets us go alone and here we are suffering in his absence. It's like some of us sometimes as we reflect on our journey with Jesus. Somehow we feel ourselves in the boat alone and storms of life rage in our lives and ask ourselves that does Jesus still is with us? If he knew that we are going to face such calamities, why has he allowed us to go alone? Oh friends, as they've been driven to their deepest despair. As they were confused and asking so many questions about the care and love of their master. There was something within their boat that could have reminded them of the care and, 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 and comfort and the blessings of God and even the presence of his grace amongst them. You see, during the day when the miracle of bread has been performed, Jesus had asked them to gather the turf baskets or the loaves of bread and then some of them they might have gathered them into the boat so in the midst of their journey when the storms were raging even in the dark, darkest moment the baskets of bread should have reminded them that there was once a crisis in the land and Jesus came through and the same Jesus that brought the loaves of bread in times of crisis will surely see us now in the midst of our storms oh friends when calamity seems to sail on your way look around for the bread of life the loaves of bread in your life remember the storms and the crisis that God saw you through in the midst of your crisis the song writer says when darkness seems to veil his face rest on his unchanging grace it was that man who lay down for 38 years jesus came to him and says pick up your mat and walk i'm sure at some point in his life when things will change again he would look when you are sleeping now in a bed a wonderful bed but when things change again when friends desert him when sickness come again he will look at that mat and say i was once in that mat and Jesus came to me and picked me up. And the same Jesus that took me out of that mat will surely see me now, even when I fall sick and my friends have deserted me. In case death comes knocking in his door again, he will look at that mat and says, I was once in that mat, almost about to die. But Jesus came to me. And that same Jesus, not another, but that same Jesus who lifted me up in the midst of my deepest despair, when my life was wasting away will surely see me now when I go six feet under he would have sang like David though I walk through the valley of the shade of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me it was that widow friends in the book of Kings chapter 17 when Elisha had come and performed the miracle of flour and a jar of oil when her son was about to die the jars of oil would have reminded her that death came and knocked and I almost almost died with my son but Jesus came through the same God who brought the jars of oil and flour will surely see me now even when my son is about to die look around for the bread around of your life the mercies that have surrounded you God does not leave us hopeless. There are always traces of his mercy surrounding us even in the midst of storms of life that seems to be raging and as they were struggling the Bible says to their shock, they could see someone walking towards them. As they look gazing upon uh, that somebody and they say to themselves, perhaps it's a ghost, but Jesus was coming towards their way, walking in the water. That was about three or four miles. There was no record in this text on this story that they even cried out to God or to Jesus himself. The last thing that they would have done is to cry out to a God who had left them and went to the mountain, who has deserted them and disappointed them. Thou, as they are in the middle of the storm, three or four miles, even if they were to cry out to the Lord in the mountains, that distance is too wide for Jesus to hear them. 
But in the midst of their struggling to survive, Jesus comes walking in the water towards them. Not because of their cry, my brothers and sisters, but because of the crisis that they were going through. And that's the Jesus I want to present to you today. It is not our cry that brings him closer to us, but the very crisis that we face, the mess that we find ourselves in is enough to bring Jesus closer to us. The pain, the sorrows, our despairs, our broken dreams are enough. They speak louder to Jesus Christ and comes closer to us. Or the Bible says he's near to those that are broken hearted. The cross of Jesus, that old rugged cross in Mount Golgotha stands as the perpetual reminder and speaks out louder that it is not the cry that brings God closer to us, that the mess that we are in, the pain that we are in, brings him closer to us. And if God can come, can come to us just because of our tears and our pain, how much more when we call upon his name? Or he says in Psalms, call upon me in the day of your trouble and I will deliver you. If if he can come to us in the midst of our mess, if the pain that we are going through, if the crisis that we are going through is enough to call him closer to us, how much more when we call on him, on his name? Oh, one writer says, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, your fears before God. You do not weary him. You do not burden him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the pain that the children, his children are going through. Take everything, not just some, but everything that perplexes the mind. One songwriter says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. We can carry everything, the small things and even the painful ones, the burdens that seem to be so heavy. We can call on the name of Jesus. If he can come because of the crisis, how much more when we call on his name? Or he comes walking. I like this part. Because he doesn't fly, he could have done that like angels. And come with a supersonic speed and arrive at the point even when the storm had not started. He could have decided any other way. This same God, friend, he actually spotted in the book of Genesis, walking gently to go to Sodom, to judge it. And this time, he also walks in the sea. I mean, in the time of crisis, we would understand when he goes to judge. He delays, he's a patient God. But here in times of crisis, where they needed him most, he just comes walking. Or he walks to remind them and to remind also you and I, that that which threatened their life, he walks on it. He tramples on it. He is as if saying before even uttering any words that what now threatens your life is this water around you. That you are afraid of drowning. But I come to you walking, reminding you that what, that which threatens your life, I walk on it. And God is reminding us today that whatever that keeps us awake at night, that brings tears, confuses us, he just tramples on it. There is no burden that is too heavy for him to bear. It was John the Revelator in chapter 1 of Revelation when he saw Jesus. He says and testifies or records that he fell down as a dead man. And Jesus just touched him and says, do not be afraid. Behold, I'm he who is alive. I was once dead, and now I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. He says, that which you are afraid, I've already conquered. And here is the evidence. I am alive. I was once dead. I am alive. But there is more than that. I hold the keys to every grave. That which threatens us and the greatest fear that we have the greater threat for any humanity is death. And Jesus says to each one of us today, that which you are afraid, I have already conquered. Do not be afraid. I trample on it. I can take care of your problems, no matter how many and how heavy they are. But there's another reason again why Jesus had to walk on water. You see, when he performed the miracle there by the land, and fed all the multitude, they testified and concluded that he is actually a prophet. That means he can see at a distance. 
He can see what is coming. And they wanted to make him king just within their territory. In fact, they were so, so, so short-sighted that they wanted to make him king of Israel alone so that no problems would be seen again in Israel. But now he walks on water to remind them that he rules the land, he rules the heavens, and also rules the sea. He is God of all the nature that they could ever think or imagine that he rules everything and that which is below the sea. He is actually in control of everything. He is the creator of everything that they could think of. He is not only in charge of the land, but also in charge of the sea. Oh, friends, I submit to you today, Jesus Christ, who rules not only the land, but the heavens and the sea. He takes care of our financial problems, but rules also, friends, our health. He rules also our parenthood and even the challenges that we face, he is in control of them. He has our future. He is not the prophet who sees the future, but he is God who has actually been to the future and holds our future in his hands. We can trust this Jesus today, even as he walks in water, sending a message that he is in control. God is in control today, my brothers and sisters. Whatever we go through, it does not come to us and he does not shake his head or scratch his head. He knows exactly what we're going through. He knows our future. Our lives and times are in his hands. Nothing is taking him by surprise. And if he knows it, he can handle it. If he knows it, he has a solution for it. And so he comes closer to them and says, do not be afraid, I am here. What comforting words to the disciples. I am here, I am not far from you. And the Bible says they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately, not later, but immediately, the boat was at the land where they were going. They were willing to take him to the boat and immediately the boat reached the destination where it was heading. You know, without Jesus Christ, picture for a moment in the midst of this storm, and if Jesus had not arrived, probably the story would have, been, would have to be rewritten, that he who started the kingdom with 12 disciples collapsed it before it began. For all the 12 disciples had drowned into the sea, if Christ had not been there, they would not have survived the storm. But probably they would have tried. These are experienced fishermen. They know the storms that they encounter as they go fishing by night. And probably if they would have reached the shore, they would not have reached the destination where they were heading. Storms have a way of just throwing the boats and the ships and land into destination that were never imagined by the sailors. By the sailors. But here with Jesus in their boat, the story is changed altogether because there is no delay. But the Bible says immediately they reach not the shore, but the destination where they were heading. Just for a focus here a bit, because the Bible is silent about Jesus calming the storm. There is no mentioning here in the story that Jesus somehow calmed the storm and then they invited him into the boat. No, that's not the testimony of the writer. Nor is the Bible saying as soon as they invited him to the boat, the storms became calm or the sea became calm. As if to give us a false impression that when Jesus comes into our lives, somehow sickness vanishes, storms of life becomes calm. Like many pastors and bishops and ministers who have promised many of us, we have turned into the pulpit and say, join my church and you'll get a job. Join my church and your sickness will vanish. Join a church and you'll get a beautiful husband or a, or a wife. That's not what Jesus has done here. There is not mentioning of any storm that has been calm. But the Bible says in the midst of the storm, the boat reached the destination where it was heading immediately. And I want to close today and remind each one of us that Jesus comes into our lives, may not calm all the storms at the time when we want him to do so, at the time of our expectations. But the destination is guaranteed. That in the midst of the storms, 
He will surely make sure that the boat arrives at the destination. This God does not depend on the calm seas to make sure that we reach the destination. But in the midst of the storms, he is able beyond our imagination, exceedingly abundantly, beyond our fondest dreams, beyond our expectations, to make us reach the destination. Oh, I look at my life and my journey with God in the midst of my boats of life as I'm heading. I look at my life and I've seen, friends, storms of life raging in my family, in the midst of my family and in my own life. I've seen death snatching the loved ones. My parents at an early age not knowing how we are going to face the future. I've seen, friends, dreams crumbling before my very eyes. I've seen it, friends. I've seen it. There are financial problems, sickness knocking in the doors of our families. I've seen, friends, blessing sleeping before my hands. I've seen it. I've lost so many battles, friends, even in the midst of my fears. But when I look back where I have been, compared to where I am now, I am glad to testify to you that the Lord Jesus, all the way, all the way, the Lord, my Savior, has led me. Can I doubt his tender mercies who through life has been my God? God forbid, friends, for I know whatever befallen me. Jesus told thing well. When I look at my life, friends, to where I've come from and compared to where I am now, I'm still testifying today, friends, that all the way my Savior has led me. Cheese each winding path I trade. Gives me grace for every trial. Feed me with the living bread. And when my weary steps falter, and my soul at first may be, I see the rock before me, gushing the waters come from me, and comfort me, and revise my spirit. And now, friends, I do not need to know how many storms are ahead of me. I don't need to know what kind of sickness will be ahead of me, what storms of life are ahead of me. I have enough evidence in the past that the Lord that has led me this far will surely make me reach the destination that I'm heading. I do not now doubt his tender mercies because the Lord's hand has been with me through and through. And I want to say to somebody today, in the midst of your storms, Jesus still leads you. You may not have enough finances to carry you through in the midst of your studies. But at the end, the destination is guaranteed. You'll have your degree or your diploma in your hands. You may not be well, healthy every day, but even in the midst of your sickness, God will ensure that your dreams are realized. You may not have enough finances to carry your, your dream, your business, but friends, in the midst of those challenges, there is a God in heaven who carries your future, and you'll make sure that in the midst of the storms of life, the destination, your destination, is certain. Oh, friends, here are the disciples. Jesus had come to them walking, and as he stopped by to them, after announcing to them, calming their storm, that do not be afraid, I am here. The story says they were willing to take him into their boat. And immediately, the boat reached the destination where it was heading. Maybe their main testimony is not that the boat reached the destination where it was heading in the midst of the storm. But the greatest testimony is here, that they were willing to take him into the boat. You see, the issue was not Christ's willingness. That has been sorted out. The fact that he came walking into the water, it shows that he's willing, his desire to save us to the uttermost. It was enough. But... Are they willing to take you into the boat? He did not force himself into the boat. could have done that. But Jesus just came walking and assured them that he is there for them. They were willing to take him into the boat. And that made all the difference. Them inviting him made the whole... It changed their future. It changed their present crisis. It changed their outlook of life. It even changed how they looked at the past because they blamed him. They were disappointed. But now that he came into the boat, even the past now was actually looked into the proper perspective. 
When we invite Christ, it is not only the future that is changed, but even our perspective of the past is transformed. We relook and redefined everything. Oh, I invite you today to invite Jesus into your life. In the midst of your storms, you may have some challenges. There may be burdens in your life. Your marriage may be falling apart. You may have sicknesses. Whatever burdens you are going through, invite Jesus willingly into your heart. And it makes the whole difference. When Jesus is in our hearts, in the boat of our lives, the destination is guaranteed. In the midst of our storms, we are assured that Jesus will lead, will lead us all the way. Oh, friends, I do not believe that any man, that any man can solve the problems of life without the person of Jesus Christ. There are tremendous problems that we are going through, tremendous marital problems. There are physical problems. There are financial problems. There are problems that sin inhabits that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or oh, today, even as I close, I am glad to announce to you today that the Lord Jesus can be received your sins forgiven, your burdens lifted, your problems solved by turning your life over to him, repenting of your sins, and accepting him as your Lord and Savior. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you today that in the midst of the storms of life, Jesus is an ever-present help in times of trouble. We thank you today that we are never alone, that Jesus cares for us, and he sounds and speaks to us that we need not fear for any storms in our lives. We ask that, Lord, we may open our hearts today to invite him in our lives. I pray for somebody today listening, whether far or near, that to open their hearts to invite Jesus. That whatever questions that they have, whether frustration that they are going through, in the midst of their broken dreams and deepest despair and shattered hopes, I pray that they may just invite Jesus. And as the testimony of the disciples, that in the midst of our storms, our destination is guaranteed. Keep us safe in the palm of your hands. In our disappointment, teach us to trust in you today. At whatever times and many times that, Lord, we have complained and we have lost hope in you, we pray that today we may revive our faith that we may continue to walk with you. That one day we may have a testimony as we stand by the sea of glass and we may sing the song through endless ages that all the way our Savior has led us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.